Bukola Adebi was born into an average family. She's the last of five children. It was fun having some big brothers and a big sister pushing you around. Uh, and you can imagine if um, the next two to me were boys. So I grew up learning to fight for myself, play football, climb trees. Good education was a top priority for her parents. If we went to the best of schools he could afford, you know, which was one of the, the key things that happened in my background, you know, that made my life what it is today. She studied management and accounting at Obafemi Awolowo University, but a part of her loved us to beat. I enjoyed drama, I enjoyed dance. Um, I started a, um, a traditional dance ministry with a couple of friends. Then a defining moment came. In university, I discovered purpose because I discovered that, you know, we meet somebody looking moody or depressed and all that and you're wondering what's wrong with you and the person by the time you finish sharing with this person you discover that what's challenging the person is something you can actually solve despite the fact that she had a comfortable background she says she loved to do business in order to always have money i've always been the type that likes buying and selling when i'm going to school even though i was in private schools and all that i'll pluck mango in my bag cashews, different things. When I get to school, I'll sell it all. So when I entered university, one of the reasons why I had, you know, to an extent, was not only because I had um, senior ones supporting, apart from my parents, I was always selling. I remember when I was in my final year, was it part three or, I think it was my final year, I was selling shower cups and I was making good profit. So I was always having, thinking of an idea to get more that I can now use to, it wasn't for, I wasn't the type that liked fashion or liked, you understand, I was a very, I wasn't a flamboyant type at all. So what were you doing with your money? That is it, I share. I remember in my final year, I had some people that were living on me. She graduated from the university in 2002, but couldn't go for the National Youth Service Program until 2004. The two-year waiting period wasn't a time to idle away. I worked partially somewhere in Ibadan. Then from Ibadan, I came to Lagos and got a job in VI. I was enjoying myself. There was a car, there was a driver, I was well paid. And, you know, at that time, for somebody that did not even have <laughs> a result. And um, I let go of the job in January 2003. I started my own business, personal business, February 2003. And what was I into? Definitely buying and selling. <laughs> I was into supplies. I was equally selling, you know, um, GSM phones to individuals. Then I started marketing cooperatives. In less than six months, I had a turnover of almost two million. Bukola says she couldn't continue in that thriving business because a greater passion took control of her. I remember a friend of mine that I was sharing with and I was telling him that I would like to have a vision where I would even um, economically empower physically challenged people too and begin to help them learn trades, bring them together in a group, let, help them learn trades, help them have a structure where they can have exhibition, this and that. You know, I always had very big visions for humanitarian service. I got the vision of jacking, I think September. And we started fully by October of 2003. So I'd already run jacking from October all the way to the next year, August, before I went for NYC in September. She was posted to Zamfara State for the National Youth Service. Whilst there, she did not hide her humanitarian service side. Even from NYC, from the camp, I had already started, you know, grooming people, coppers, telling them about jacking and what we just do, helping people, touching life. So I had people that started coming together, were holding meetings. Bukola's primary place of assignment was Babakura local government area, where she started a non-governmental organization in Gusau, the state capital. I called it um, Samaritan Club there. And what were we doing? Brought together a group of coppers, right? I can't remember what I sold then. I think I sold bookmarks or so, <laughs> used it to raise funds, came up with the idea that, okay, the, the, the hospital in Bakura was always dirty. So 
um, we're able to raise like 12,000 plus from those bookmarks that were sold and you know i started jacking also because bakura was like in the center of guso and sokoto state so i started jacking also in sokoto state and i always travel off and on maybe on a daily basis just go and check how the team they are doing so from there we raised like that twelve thousand. came up with a list of cleaning things that was needed um brooms um scrubbing brushes um detergent every um CD day, we we'll go to the hospital, we we'll go and wash a particular. We we'll just ask them which which of their wards needs the most touching. So it was a particular um, day also mobilized coppers and along with the club members, we made them um, zobo drink and some snacks. Mobilized people to go to the bar or went to clean up the old place. There's always stagnant water. We removed everything. You know, made the water. And the environment conducive and healthy hygienic for people which was a fantastic thing so by the time i was through with my nyc then you know we i had to i handed over the club to zanfara state nyc and moved on so that they could and i understand that till date they are still called um samaritan club so probably very few people will know the history that it actually belongs to jackin Youth service over, she left for Lagos with a clear idea of her next line of action. Friends rallied round her when she shared her idea with them. I shared with a friend of mine. You know, I was holding a, a house fellowship in their house then, and she told me that her um, mom, I, that her mom, had a shop right in front of their house that she's not been using. That probably I should talk to her. And being a house fellowship leader then, it was easy for me to, because she's like my mom too. So I went to meet her, mommy, this is what I plan to do. So she gave me her space. So I shared with some other friends, about seven of us, and they came together and assisted me to move the things in the shop into the BQ. She needed money to run the outfit, and her business acumen was awakened. She borrowed 45,000 naira from her father to start a bookmark business. He never knew I was starting an NGO. He thought it was my usual business I was starting all over. So I borrowed the 45,000 from him. And that was how we made plenty of the bookmarks. And I started, we started selling just myself and the one other girl. She was in last with them. At first, she waited for the money to accumulate, but in a second thought, decided to give out the little she made from time to time. The first place that we supported was old people's home at Onike. Gradually, Individuals started knowing and they started approaching us and we went into the aspect of individual support. Soon after, a major disaster happened in her neighborhood. Two to three years after we were there, there was a fire disaster in Iwaiad. About night, seven families were affected. The whole street was burnt down. And when I was told, I went there, I said, God, well, where will we start from? started inviting them down to our office. Got some some friends that already knew what I was doing. Then, you know, I was through my NYC, so more people started knowing what I do. And we started, we made letters and started distributing around the community. So we went to all the other, you know, eyebrow areas around. We started telling them to give us clothes. You know, sensitizing them about the incidents and telling them about jacking that they could give us used items. For complete three months, we had heaps of clothes in front of our office. People just come, pick. Then we started interviewing each family to assess what did they lose. So when we were through for those few months, we now found out that both, most of them were trying to restart their lives. But it was difficult because they were squatting and they could not even get, some of them still share stuff. Share pots, share this, share buckets, their children, school fees, and everything. They still have to think about school items for their children. So, all those other fundamental things was like a major punishment to them. So, we just agree within us that, okay, why don't we see how we can work around giving each family a storage drum, a 60 liter storage drum, a brand new kerosene stove, 25 liter jerry can. Um, six plates, six spoons, six cups, a um, turning stick, two um, cooking spoons, then um, two pots, 
then um what else do we give them then i think just basically you know those stuff like that that sorted out more people got interested in what she was doing and started supporting her from the first person that did, will collect your data your name your phone number your email your address and we put it together the database every month end we we'll do one small emails letter send it to them tell them what we did in that month so gradually people started picking interest the program she started in zamfara grew in leaps and bounds I remember there was a flood disaster in Zamfara State too. When their dam broke and we were informed that quite a number of villages were wiped out and they were in camps, we went with a J5 load of um, clothes from, I followed the bus to myself, from Lagos all the way to Zamfara State to go and give them in the camp. Many people around us need help, but this organization knows how to single out the ones that need her services. When you come in, we fill a benevolence form for you. Once we fill that form, we find out if you are coming with health issues and you have drug prescription, we can help you with drugs as long as we have the resources. Two, on the spot also, we can give you um, clothes, foodstuffs. Once we can see, uh, obviously, that you need them, then the next step is for us to verify you and go and visit that person at home. Though Jackin reaches out to most people in need, Bukola maintains that there are core areas. One is orphans and vulnerable children. Second one, widows. People. Then third one, people living with HIV. Then youths, basically in and out of school youths. Then the last set, because there's the less privileged families. There was one elderly woman that came last year. She's about 82 years old. She takes care of two, a set of twin, I think twin boys, and. She, you know, my man was just going to her. I just said, go and look for this mama. Because her children are no more and these are grandchildren. My man just kept on going to her. Then we got to her, she didn't have any food. Look at the case of the lady that the child was in the hospital for two and a half months. We had known about her case that January, that her husband died in January and she was she had six children. She was pregnant with the sixth one and she was a very young widow. She was just 30 years so. old. So we set her up in a small business. All the children had dropped out of school since when we got to meet her. So we had to re-enroll them in another school because they had moved away from where they were living before. Put the children, all the children back in school. And they were members of our children's club. So on that particular day, it was in September, was it September or October, they were having the children's club meeting. And I came and I just saw, she. I heard she delivered on a Tuesday. and. I just saw somebody leaving before prayer was said, closing prayer was said. And I come, I said, who is this person leaving before prayer is said? She just I said, ah, say this woman, no. I just said, you know the one that just delivered on Tuesday? I said, yes. I said, okay. I just counted the children. I saw that instead of five, you know, the sixth one is still the one she's nursing. There were four. So I said, ah, where is the fifth child? And that was the boy. She said ah, that the boy is ill. The boy is, I said, ah, what happened to the boy? She didn't come to tell me. You know, I was one that was the hack stars. What happened to the boy? He said the boy's um, hands and legs are swollen. The boy cannot poop for a week. The boy is no more eating. The boy was given an overdose of drugs. You know, when she took her to a hospital, this and that. I said, go and bring the boy. And she went to bring the boy. And that was how the journey began. That day, we took the boy to about five different hospitals. My husband is a doctor. The medical doctor boys into public health too I told my husband about it my husband followed us and doctors were on strike so in fact the my mom paid the thirty thousand in the last hospital that accepted the boy needed blood the boy needed oxygen the boy would have died that day if i didn't just ask the boy and meanwhile when i asked my staff to just take the boy to a hospital i had even forgotten that doctors were on strike the doctor that attended to them was just sheer favor. Just said they should go and run a test in a private whatever lab. We paid for that one, and the man said they should rush the boy to loot. Unfortunately, loot was on strike also, so we called one of the pediatricians that had come to train the children before. So the lady said, "Okay, she's not even around, but let them see what they can do." So my husband said, "Being a doctor, let him follow us," and that was how he followed us. From there. We took the boy. They did not have a bed space for the boy in loot. 
the, in fact, the woman used all her influence to see how they could do. And the boy needed oxygen and blood seriously. From there, we took the boy to a um, federal medical center. They couldn't take the boy. Took the boy to another private. That day, we got home five minutes past 2 a.m. Myself and my husband and my staff. And as we were driving into the estate, they called us back again from Bagada, from a private hospital that finally took the boy. And they were telling us that we should come and take the boy again. That they did not have blood that could match his blood. I told them, I said, God will sustain this boy till the next morning. God told me, just knelt down and prayed for the boy's recovery. The next morning, 6.30, I had called the doctor. They said, miraculously, the boy's PCV rose without collecting blood. And that they didn't even need to give the boy oxygen. As I was, I still got to my church that Sunday morning. I said, okay, from church, I will come and check the boy. They called us again from the hospital. And that time, the mother and the newborn baby that they've not even named were the ones in the hospital with the boy. On that same Saturday, I was telling my husband that ah, this boy's case, I hope it's not going to be a serious case, that we don't have a dying in the office, I mean, in the office towards this boy's treatment. My, brother, my husband was supposed to travel that weekend. He used his travel money to pay for that boy's treatment at that private hospital. And that afternoon, as I was still thinking in my mind that God, what was going to happen to this boy if we don't get money? My husband said that. He was telling me that, look, Shebi is you. If God said you should help this boy, he will send the resources. This is not the first time God has done it for you. Just have that faith. My phone just rang. A partner just called me and just said, okay, as I said, I, she said, do we have any emergency on our hands? Ah, I said there's emergency on <laughs> But I don't know how bad it's going to be. She just said, okay. I should send somebody to pick up a check on Monday. On that Saturday, by okay, the Sunday morning, as I was still sharing with my pastor, please pray with us on this case, this and that. We don't know what is going on yet. The pediatrician just called us from that private hospital and said, okay, that their pediatrician was just arriving. It was just um, a, another doctor that saw him, and the pediatrician said that from what they can see, it looks like the boy had twisted his test time. <laughs> And that the boy will need a, an urgent surgery. I was just looking at in a private hospital. Where do we want to start? Immediately after we dropped the call, phone, the doctor and Lutz just called me that they found the bed space. Definitely Lutz will be cheaper for us. So we just headed straight for Bagada. Getting there, a child that has not been eating and has not pooped for a week. When we just checked the poop, we just saw worm coming out. Big worm, as big as my finger. When we got to Lutz, almost six doctors. We were examining just this boy. I was watching them. The next thing, that doctor that we knew carried the boy herself with my husband. They were rushing to where they were going to do x -ray. I was wondering what was going on. The boys had, had shifted to the other side. That day we left Lutz around 9 p.m. With the mother and the baby still left and the child that is sick. The next morning, they were to do an emergency surgery for the boy. They said his chest was filled with pus and they had to start draining on Monday morning. That same Monday morning, the partner that called me on Saturday that do we have any case that we should send somebody to pick up a check, gave us a check of 100,000 Naira. By the time that boy was discharged, after two and a half months, we had spent over 250,000 that we could not trace. Another person was brought here that had ania, a little boy that had very terrible ania, very, very terrible, and we did the surgery for the boy. And from there, we were able to set up the mother in a business. 14 people are on her payroll. About 300 volunteers help out when there's a major event. I've been working with Jacken for five years now. Jacken is a good place to work because we, we, we see ourselves as a family in Jacken. We do things together. We're involved in decision making. We come together. We have a deliberation on some tasks to be carried out. I see it happening. Even while we don't have resources to meet it, I see it happening. In everything you do, she will tell you to put God first and to think deep before you do anything. I used to be a very shy person. I don't know how to look into people's eyes and she has really taught me a lot. You know, working here, I've, 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 I've gained my, my confidence, my self-confidence. Bukona's husband tells us the kind of woman he married. I married my wife. I married my friend, I married my partner, I married the same visionary, I married uh, the 
Christ and I go to God, we'll take care of me and my children. She's a go getter. She loves children, she loves widows, she loves people who are burdened in one way or the other. Bukola Adebi, through her non governmental organization, has assisted over 10,000 less privileged people in the areas of sponsorship through school, health care, job provision, welfare for prisoners, and many more. War victims in Sudan and Liberia have also benefited from her. This she does full time, and one wonders how long she will be this benevolent. When you say, How far can I go? I'll just say, I can reach heaven. Because all I need is God, and I cannot really say He has never disappointed. My greatest dream is that in the next two, three years, God will provide us with a land in this same environment that we have been in and build a two story building. We still have a very important project that is dear to us that we are yet to start. Bukola Adebi believes that she's fulfilling destiny. Putting spies on faces brings untold joy and fulfillment to her. That makes life beautiful, she says.